Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. The world lost a fantastic leader and rabbi this week. Harold Kushner of blessed memory died. For those of you who never had the blessing of knowing Rabbi Kushner personally, you probably knew of him and his works. First of all, his nephew, Izzy Kushner, is not only a member of our synagogue, but part of our executive leadership team here at the temple. But most of you became familiar with Rabbi Kushner in 1981, a few short years after tragedy fell upon Rabbi Kushner, and he wrote a book entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. The book was sparked by a tragedy in Rabbi Kushner and his own wife's life. They had a three-year-old son who wasn't developing properly. And the day after their daughter was born, their son got the diagnosis, as did they, that he had the fatal and rare genetic disease called progeria. For those who are unfamiliar with progeria, it's a very rare and horrible disease that basically advances someone's age almost a decade per year, and the life expectancy is anywhere between nine and 15 years. There is no cure for it, and it stunts all types of growth and uh, maturation, and it can be incredibly alienating and painful for all who are involved. Rabbi Kushner's son indeed died at the age of 14, one day after his 14th birthday. As anyone would imagine, he was absolutely devastated. He also had earned, in addition to his rabbinic degree, a degree in theology from the Jewish Theological Seminary. And he decided to pen a very short book, a pretty quick read, entitled When Bad Things Happen to Good People. He did it because he realized that as a congregational rabbi in Natick, Massachusetts, he was helping people cope with the grief in their lives, but without many answers. And he realized that indeed things were happening and people were looking for a reason why they were happening. In the book, he tells the story that I often retell, a story about a couple whose 19-year-old daughter was on her college campus, was walking across the street on campus, was suffering from a terrible headache, fell on the street, and died an hour later of a brain aneurysm. It's a horrible tragedy of which there are no words. Rabbi Kushner officiated at the funeral, gave as much consolation to this grieving couple as one could imagine in such a horrible time. And about a month and a half later, the family came in to see the rabbi in his office. He sat with them in a very pastoral way and gave them all of the empathy and sympathy and time that they needed. They looked at him with this pain in their eyes, and then they blurted out together in unison this confession, this admission to the rabbi. They said, Rabbi, we didn't fast last Yom Kippur. They were convinced that the reason why their daughter died of an aneurysm on her college campus was because they chose not to fast on Yom Kippur. They believed in this idea of reward and punishment and that things were happening for a reason, but a reason that just didn't make sense. It was moments like these in the pastoral role of Rabbi Kushner that he experienced as a father and as a rabbi that stoked him to pen this first book. Never, never did he imagine it would get the response that it received. And what he said to the New York Times on the 25th anniversary of the book in 1996, which sold, I think, close to 10 million copies in its first years alone and sat on top of the New York Times bestseller list for years, was that what he realized was that the world, not necessarily the Jewish world, but the belief-based world, people who were part of a religion, whether it be any form of Christianity, any denomination of Judaism, any stream of Islam, or any other major religion, that people in these religions were suffering and religion did not have an answer for them. 
Religion couldn't console them. Religion couldn't explain to them. Religion couldn't help them grieve. We know that there are problems with theology based on this very same concept. In the second paragraph of the Shema, the paragraph that is most often overlooked, that most people don't know, that most people for sure don't know by heart, is this very same theological concept that tells us if we're good, rain will fall, which is of course a metaphor. And if we're not good, well, then our lands will be dry, continuing the metaphor. The only problem is, is that we know sometimes we're not good and the rain comes down. And sometimes we are good and the rain is barren. So what happened through this personal lens and this bearing of his soul that Rabbi Kushner put in this book about the grief in which he suffered was he finally started introducing something to American belief-based conversation and in particular Jewish-based conversation that really was absent for decades before. And that is God. People didn't talk about God. People didn't discuss where is God, when is God, how is God, why is God. And Rabbi Kushner opened up the floodgates to discussing God with all of us and telling us God is sometimes hard to understand, but we have to put proper parameters on God and our understanding of God. There was a study a handful of years ago that was done where they took two groups of people in a hospital who were all in the ICU, all with terminal conditions. Half of the group were faith-based, the other half were not. And a group of people prayed on behalf of those who were faith-based and those who were not, they didn't pray for. And what happened? Nothing. Meaning the diagnosis and the trajectory of the illness for the people who were prayed for and the people who weren't were basically identical. And Kushner responded in his brilliant way, even a handful of years ago, sharp as a tack. He said, that's not what God is. Too many people in the world of faith believe that God is equivalent to Santa Claus, that you pray for something and that it will happen for you and if it doesn't happen for you, God didn't hear you. That isn't how God works, he says. What heals people who are sick is doctors and medicine. But what gives people the bravery to deal with their illness, what gives families the conviction and the strength to give support and love, what gives us the bandwidth to find time when we're addressing these challenges, that is the inspiration of God. He came to the conclusion in his book and throughout his life that sometimes we cannot explain the bad things that happen to good people. And there are other times that we can't justify the good things that happen to bad people. And it can be incredibly frustrating. But he gets us to understand this concept that that's not the notion of how God works. God in many ways is more complicated and in other ways a lot more simplistic. But we shouldn't confuse the role of God and the needs of God for what it is that we are expecting from God. The rabbis throughout their history have struggled with this very concept. And to be fair, it's not limited to the rabbis. How many religions tell us we're suffering in this world so we can be rewarded in the world to come. That's a basic tenet of Christianity and of Islam. And in Judaism, we're reminded of the world to come, olam haba, with the same idea, that that world will be good and better. But I am convinced personally, as I think Kushner was, that that is a construct that we have come up with to explain or to help us cope and understand with the idea of why bad things happen to good people. In fact, in the Babylonian Talmud, there comes a case before the rabbis of someone who is suffering 
and they say, why is this person suffering? And the rabbis say, because they did something wrong. And then they come before the rabbis, they say, but the person is young, they did nothing wrong. And they say, well, it's because they didn't study enough Torah in their lives. They say, well, this person was a Bible scholar. This person was a Talmud scholar. They studied all the time. Well, it's because God punishes those that God loves. The answer that the Talmud gave us is that exact quizzical face you just had. They don't have an answer for why bad things happen to good people. They can't explain why the righteous suffer, but they were fearful that people would leave our religion if we couldn't give them a good reason why these things happened. I had the blessing of meeting and studying with and learning from Rabbi Harold Kushner. In fact, he was one of the people who inspired me the most into my ability to offer divrei Torah and sermons. When people asked Harold Kushner, what's the most important book you turn to when offering a Devar Torah, when offering a sermon, when preaching, he always had the same response. It's not one book, it's two, and one of them's not a book. He always said it was the Bible and the New York Times. Because if you can't relate what's happening in people's lives and in the world today to our history and ancestry, and you can't make it real and relatable for the challenges and moments that all of us are looking at and facing, then we have failed in our job of explaining the Torah. And he was right. He was eloquent, he was real, he was personable. And there isn't a person who comes into my office suffering from a pain or a challenge that often I have no words that offer counsel or, or relief towards. But I keep at least two dozen copies on hand at all times of that book and hand it out to others as a source of compass and inspiration for those who are challenged or in pain or suffering, not because it will heal, because it brings the process of hope and understanding about the relationship of God. In closing today, I'd like to read something Harold Kushner wrote. He wrote it just a couple of years ago, before his death, and it is quite beautiful. He wrote a letter to the world. Dear world, we've been through a lot together over the past eight decades, you and I, marriages, births, deaths, fulfillment, and disappointment, war and peace, good times, and hard times. There were days when you were more generous to me than I could possibly have deserved, and there were days when you cheated me out of things I felt entitled to. There were days when you looked so achingly beautiful that I could hardly believe you were mine, and there were days when you broke my heart and reduced me to tears. But with it all, I choose to love you, world. I love you whether you deserve it or not. I love you in part because you are the only world I have. I love you because I like who I am so much better when I love you. But mostly I love you, world, because loving you makes it easier for me to be grateful for today and hopeful about tomorrow. Love does that. I love you, world. Faithfully yours, Rabbi Harold Kushner. I think Rabbi Kushner is sitting in the Yeshiva Shalmala, in the heavenly abode, sitting down and having a very important meeting and a good conversation with a lot of questions answered with God. And I pray that sitting by his side is his son Aaron, his wife who predeceased him, and a world that looks up to him in appreciation for introducing us four decades ago to that conversation about God and bringing God into all of the faith world's lives. May his memory be a blessing, and may he forever rest in the peace that he deserves. Amen.